Welcome, this is Lombardi Live. And Lombardi, me, I'm out of town. But what do they say, Elias? The show must go on, right? So a dear friend of mine will be sitting in for me. When we were growing up as teenagers, he used to say, Don, I have a golden rule. When you send a sub for the gig, be sure he can do the job, but be sure he doesn't play better than you do. Well, I violated his golden rule today, I think, because he's a great host and he has a great guest. Here is my lifelong friend, Johnny Vatos Hernandez, the heartbeat of the legendary Oingo Boingo, with his special guest, Jim Riley, the drummer and musical director of Rascal Flats. Here's Johnny. Here we are at the Drum Channel. Hello, I'm Johnny Vatos Hernandez, and uh, we have our great guest, Jim Riley, who's uh, written a book called The Survival Guide for the Modern Drummer. Jim, it's so great to have you here, man. man. It's always great to see you, man. Oh, man, it's just, I, I'm just blown away. We were talking earlier, one of the things uh, you brought up was really interesting is that you actually wrote these charts first. Yeah. And, and, and the drum parts happened after them. Definitely. Well, the, the whole premise for, for writing the book was I wanted to try to create a tool to help drummers that wanted to raise their game, they wanted to be able to say yes to more stuff. Uh, I think there's a lot of drummers out there, they maybe they came up playing metal and all they did was metal and they loved it and then all of a sudden opportunities dried up. They're like, I love playing drums but I have no outlet. So they discover, wow, if I learn to play some blues, I learn to play some, some jazz, I learn to play some, uh, some hip hop or I learn to play country, there might be some gigs uh, that, were, uh, that are available to me now that were not available before. And one of the keys to my own success has been the fact that I've been able to say yes when I get called to play you know, a big band gig or if I get called to play with a Tejano band or I get called to do a metal session. Um, and, and so that's the thing is that when you become a professional player, you don't have the right to, to say no to a lot of things if you want to like keep putting yeah. putting bread on the table, you know what I'm saying? Sure. So I've patterned my career out of being someone that can say yes to a multitude of genres. So I wanted to create a tool that would help people be able to do that. So the book, uh, you know, covers, it's, there's 10 chapters, it, you know, covers everything from pop to Latin to jazz to, 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 to metal to fusion. Uh, world styles, and uh, it, it gives everybody enough of a uh, of a base of knowledge that they can survive and uh, and, and and keep uh, keep working. You started playing at a very early age. Yeah, and uh, when was that? Well, you know, some people start like super super young. I started at a very typical age. I, I was in the sixth grade. Uh, I had been begging my parents from fourth grade on to, to let me start to play drums. Finally, in the sixth grade, they said, sure, we'll let you give this a try. And uh, it was, it really kind of helped congeal a lot of things in my life. And uh, it, it was something that I was, I was good at. It was something that uh, gave me something really productive to do. And I just took to it like a fish in water. And, and uh, so I immediately was, I was taking lessons, playing in, in band at school. Uh, and then as I, uh, I got into high school, I started taking lessons with uh, Arthur Press from the Boston S Symphony. I was playing in the Greater Boston Youth Symphony, but I was also playing in my own rock bands on the side. Um, I, I, I guess I always understood the fact that you need to have the school smarts, but you also need to have the street smarts. And there's a lot of things that you, know, you need to learn that are going to be outside of those school walls. And uh, so I, I had a healthy dose of both and ended up uh, graduating from high school and going to University of North Texas. I worked at a drum shop um, prior to moving to Nashville. I lived in Kansas City. Uh, worked at a drum shop there and so I got a chance to be involved with retail and with, uh, with custom drum building which gave me a lot of insight into you know what I like about you know different drums but it also just the, the business of understanding you know, model numbers, and you know, I still remember all those Remo r model numbers. You know, from, <laughs> yeah. from stocking them. And uh, one of the things I would do as a, as a young person working at the store was I'd go around and tune every drum set in in the room, and it gave me a lot of practice. 
And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can be real meticulous with the way that I, that I tune. I have a particular uh, way that I like to tune the drums. And uh, yeah, I definitely, the first thing I always have to tell people, there are two heads on that drum. <laughs> so yeah. You can't just keep cranking on that top head and hope yeah. that great things are going to happen. You know, you got to make sure that the bottom head's doing what it, uh, what it needs to be doing as well. Excellent. And so all these different styles, you're, you, when people play notes and um, you can hear their history, you can hear where they've been, you can hear their, their integrity. Every note that you play speaks. You know, every note that you play has intent and has power. Intent is a, is a really good word. Um, I, I think that one thing, and we'll, we'll get into it, um, we've got a bunch of uh, lessons that we're posting on Drum Channel as well. But uh, that intent, making sure that every note that you're playing has an intention, that it really matters, uh, particularly, you know, like the ghost notes that you play. I think some people can put those on autopilot, but the truth is that every note that you play does matter. You've got to make sure that the quality of the sound that you're playing uh, when you're striking the drum or the cymbals records well, projects well to, uh, you know, to the microphones. You've got to make sure that everything you're playing, no matter how simple or complicated, that it serves the song. And now you asked me earlier, yeah, I did write all of the songs with only a very basic knowledge of what I wanted the drums to, to be. It was like, okay, I'm writing this 12-8 metal thing, so the, ba- the, the drums are going to be... But the... the thought of getting into it later like actually like okay what am I actually going to play on this song I don't think about that as much it's like I go I'm having a problem solve them just like everybody else Um, so like some of the songs you'll hear me play today I, I wrote from a compositional point and then I have to like kind of go okay now I have to put my drummer hat on and think how am I going to approach this as a as a drummer to really underscore what the song's all about. And your schooling, like North Texas State and all that stuff, uh, equipped you to um, to become the band leader of an incredible act. It was a really good, it was a really good start. I mean, the truth was that I always had a, an exceptional ear from a very young age. Before I started playing drums, I was actually in some really serious youth choirs, you know? Um, so I was reading music and you know, understanding, uh, you know, melody and harmony from a very early age. And it's something that came very easy to me, which most drummers, that's not necessarily the case. Um, So when I got to North Texas, this is, this is actually true. My first semester is my first semester away from home. I had a girlfriend. It was like, it was just a complete train wreck. Um, (laughs) I got an F in music theory, but I got an A in sight singing, which meant that I could I could sing and verbalize and and harmonize all of that stuff by ear. I just wasn't doing the work. So like you know, at some point I had to go, man. I, I better figure out how to study, <laughs> or this this time at North Texas is going to be really short. So I, I I learned how to I learned how to study. And uh, what was very interesting was I was actually a semester ahead from then on on my ear training than I was on the actual music theory class. And so my ear helped pull my understanding of music theory along. Yeah, so I learned a lot about, you know, music theory, music education, um, and, you know, particularly studying with Ed Sof, I learned a lot about musicality from the drummer's perspective. Oh man, Ed's, Ed's, he's a nice guy, but in a lesson, he's super intimidating. Oh. And, um, (laughs) And, but the the best thing about Ed is that he can back it up. He's yeah. a player, man. He's a player's player. So uh, it was an amazing experience. I learned a lot about musicality from Ed. I learned a lot about how to set the band up, how to make sure that the durations of the notes that I'm playing on drums matched or counterbalanced the uh, you know what was going on with the rest of the band. And even from that being in a big band perspective. I've been able to translate a lot of that knowledge over to you know other types of of music. So yeah, I had, I had a great experience at North Texas, and then when I went to Nashville in 1997, 
what I noticed was they they had these charts and they didn't they didn't look like anything I'd seen before, but as I started to examine them and realize what they were, they were nothing more than figured base and Roman numeral analysis that I had studied in college, only they were just traditional Arabic numbers. Right. And that was the Nashville number system. And so understanding that system there actually opened up a whole nother world of, you know, kind of harmonic realization for me. And um, it was, you know, my, my school smarts combined with this new knowledge that really helped put me in a position where I, I would make a great musical director for a group, you know, like as, as awesome as it is to be with, with Rascal Flatts. They hired me to be their drummer in 2000, 2001. They asked me to be the, the, the band leader MD for the, the show. And um, I've I've been there uh, doing it ever since. Wow! So d- does uh, do the Rascal Flats guys let you sing parts too? I on live I do absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. I mean, because your job is so important and and it's so epic to all of the tunes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So um, of course you know I, I don't ever sing on the, the the records. The three of them have a have an amazing sound. And I would never even want to dilute that. Right. They have, you know, I think the more voices you put with them, the more it dilutes their sound. So basically, I, I do sing with them, but it's really just to fill in in the places that, that it's really needed. There might be a part where Gary's singing lead and Jay, Jay and Joe Don and I are three, singing a three-part harmony under that. Or Gary singing lead and Jay singing another thing and Joe Don and I are singing a line together. And, and it's just really sporadic. It's just to fill in the parts to, to you know, continue like the fullness of the arrangement vocally. Um, there was something that was really fun. You're speaking of you know, my, my, my job as musical director. A couple years ago, they asked me to arrange, it's a longer story than this, but I ended up arranging uh, Pharrell's Happy uh-huh. for eight part, there was eight of us in the band, so I, I arranged that for eight part a cappella. How cool. And it was really fun. And, and you think, eight parts, man, what am I going to do? So the way that I broke it down was this you've got Gary singing lead, and then I had Jay and Joe Don kind of doing their own doo op thing, and then I had the other three of us singing three part harmony, and then there's a ba- there was a guy singing bass. And then there was the guy uh, beatboxing, and that was the eight of us. Wow, that's and so it, we did we did two songs in the show where I would actually come around from the drums, and uh, and we did this this a cappella thing, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. That was one of the neatest times I've got to. We, we really got to sing on that. You know the 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 whole animal thing uh, of all through history, all there is is melody and rhythm. Yeah, and you have the the talent of melody. And you have rhythm in your soul. It's just it's it's such a great combination. I'm just I'm just so proud of your book. So proud of all the stuff that you do. It's amazing. Every one of those songs that you play in the band is like all country music. It's 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 the last song you're ever going to hear in your life. It's got to be that good. Nashville is is you know for <laughs> some people that don't know. I mean Nashville is really the songwriter capital of the world. So it doesn't matter who they are, like even someone that doesn't, like Diane Warren that doesn't live in Nashville, comes to Nashville because everything from a songwriter perspective runs through Nashville. So, you know, we, we get the opportunity uh, as, as, you know, as with, with Rascal Flatts to, you know, to record some of, the, uh, some of the greatest songs. And then, you know, it's interesting putting the show together live, you know, how you have to kind of like, like Rascal Flatts has been around for so long. I mean, they've got like, you know, 14 number ones or something. Yeah. There's literally times where I'm putting a set list together or working with Jay to put a set list together where we're leaving hit songs off the set list because we just don't have time to do them. Sure. Um, so it, they've been a really incredibly successful group. It's been amazing to be uh, in, involved with them in every capacity that I've been able to you know, to have the ride with these guys that I've had for the last uh, 16 years, and even before that when I knew them when we were playing in the clubs. But you know what that's like, you know, coming up with somebody. The interesting thing is, is that 
you get there, like when we first started, and I know you can relate to this, it's like you're at one level, and then it kind of jumps to the next level, and it jumps to the next level, and as a musician, if you're not able to go to that level with them every time, you know, that's when you see, oh, well, that drummer was playing with them and then he got replaced. Or that drummer was playing with them, he was a sideman, and then they got a different sideman to come in. And so I've tried to continually improve as a player, uh, as a musician, and as a leader. Because, uh, you know, when these guys ask me to, to be the band leader, it means that, you know, I'm, I have to be an example for the other the musicians, even though these are world-class musicians, in terms of being prepared, in terms of what I try to give as a player. And uh, yeah, so I've had to continually improve because if you don't do that, you know, you don't, you don't get to keep taking the ride with them. There was a song that Rascal Flatts had, a big song called My Wish, came out about 10 years ago. ESPN's been using it as a, as a theme for one of their, uh, their features, and so they play the song every week. So they asked us for a new version of that song. So we gave them, we went in the studio and recorded basically the live version of what we're doing. Uh, and the label loved it so much that, you know, they, they said, hey, we want you guys to come and record at least the first half of the new record and the new single. So, uh, you know, all you can do is, uh, is do your best, be prepared, and then when you get your opportunities, you gotta, you gotta knock them out of the park. Yeah, my mom always said, look, if you're gonna play rock and roll, you're gonna have to get a job. If you're gonna play jazz, you're gonna have to get a job. But if you play everything, you'll always work. And that's, that's amazing. That's what this book will do, and that's what you've done all your life. Yeah, that's, that's been my part of the, the, the formula for my, my success in, in the business, and so this was my effort to take that and, and, and put it into a, into a package. And uh, it's been fun. Um, the, the book, I tried to make the, the cover like look as vintage as possible. <laughs> yeah, it does. Because the truth is, is I wanted it to look right, like sitting next to syncopation sure. and stick control. It does in look the good. Dobrin book. It and, does you know, look I, good. I wanted it to look like it belonged there, like somebody dusted it off and said, oh, this, this belongs right over there next to those. So you can see the, the corners are yeah. all tore up and everything. I actually had a guy say, I got my book, but the, t the corners are tore up. I said, they're not really they tore, tore up. up. They just kind of look like they are. So yeah, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to write a book that... Uh, to say with humility, I wanted it to be like a modern classic, so. You were voted number one country drummer for how many years in a row? I, I, I don't know, it's really, it's, it's, it's cool. And of course, you and I laugh about it because you know, it's, it's not about being a country drummer or right. a metal drummer. No. It's about being a working drummer. Yeah. But it's, it's nice to receive accolades yes, like that. It, it just means that people are responding to what you do. You know, between Modern Drummer and, and, and Drum Magazine, which are both fine publications, I've been voted, I think, at least five times in each one of them. Sure. Um, Drum Magazine had me, you know, this, this re I won their, their reader's poll this year. It's, it's very gratifying. Like I said, it just, I, you, you don't really like read your own press clippings and go, I yeah. must be really good. Yeah, I'm, but I'm, at the same time, <laughs> you're appreciative that people appreciate what what you're doing, and particularly with what I do, you know, trying to give back. It, it seems like that uh, people are paying attention to what I'm doing in that way, and uh, and I'm I'm always very thankful for those kinds of uh, uh, awards. In all your career, I mean, it, it could be anywhere, but is there really a concert that kind of sticks out that you know it's like ah? Oh, I'll remember that forever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a couple that come to mind, but the one that sticks out the most is um, we played Madison Square Garden in 2007. Just playing Madison Square Garden. It's that's just enough. Like, you know, that's, that's amazing. But that year, I was playing a, um, a five-piece Vistalite kit. Uh, you know, the Bonhams, you know. Yeah. It was actually, for me, it was like a baby Bonham kit. I had 13, 16, 18, 24 okay. in the Amber Vistalite. And um, so I, the, the, the drums were great, and I got to play a, a solo. I mean, and there's a lot of times with Rascal Flatts, there's some sort of drum feature, but this was just go. So I had, you know, three minutes in the show on one of our biggest tours we had probably 21 trucks on that tour and so we had this massive 
show. And so there was three minutes where it was like, just go, entertain the crowd for, you know, three minutes. Which is interesting because then it's like, oh, I mean, being, playing solos is now part of my job. Yeah. So you have to be able to do that, which is interesting to think about. So I played that solo, Madison Square Garden, and I'm going, wow, what a trip. I mean, this is the same room that John Bonham was in playing on a set of Amber Vista lights, <laughs> you know, and I'm going and I'm, I'm playing and I'm just, this is amazing. So I get, I get in the, uh, the car, they take us back to Jersey, which is where the buses are. I turn on Pladia and there is the song remains the same. And there's John Bonham playing an Amber Vista light in Madison Square Garden, playing a solo. And I went, man, I am freaking out. They're man. freaking this is, out. This is trippy, man. <laughs> Harmonic convergence. Yeah, yeah, it was it was amazing. That one that one really sticks out. That was a, that was a good memory. That's excellent. My dad was there too, which was great. That is that makes it really special. You know, I, we've all had strange <laughs> stuff happen. You've had a lot. Oh, strange I've had stuff. a lot. I'm, it'll be in my book. You'll well, be let, a- let, me, let me tell you before you ask this question. <laughs> okay. You know, Johnny and I were talking about movies that we've done, and I'm going, you know, Johnny, you really got me beat in the movie category because <laughs> you've got From Dust Till Dawn. And I've got the Hannah Montana movie. Oh. So I'm going, it doesn't really, I mean, I love that movie so much. It's great. It, it's so awesome. I mean, you're in that movie for probably at least 25 minutes or sure. something, you know? And the last thing that they say before you disappear from that earth, now let's kill that fucking band. <laughs> That's right. You know? And I just loved it, man. It was just, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's so funny, you know, it's like when I meet, of course, you know, I, I know Oingo Boingo, but uh, but when the first time I met Johnny, all I could think about was that, and I'm going, well, I definitely don't have a beat in the movie category. But you were going to ask me a question. Oh, yeah, no, so so, so a strange, crazy thing that's happened to you that you, you just can't forget or oh, it shouldn't oh. have happened. You yeah. Know, you know those situations where, <laughs> that shouldn't have happened. We, man, you know, technology is crazy, and like, so I have this rig um, where... I've got a controller next to me and I start all of the click tracks by hitting a one inch, you know, pad on, you know, one of those uh, trigger pads. And I I start all the tunes that way. And we had started a new thing a couple years ago where my triggering the computer was also triggering time code that was driving the lights and the music. And it worked perfectly, right? So... Like, we're in the first show, it works flawlessly. The second show, we get halfway through it. I, you know, and I've got, I've got two pages where it's like bank A, bank B, bank C. So I go, to, I go to the B bank, I hit the song, and it's not right. I stop it, I just count it off manual. Well, the lights aren't working, the video's not working. I'm going, well, that wasn't very good. So then I go to the next song, and it works. I'm like, okay. Whatever that was, thank God that's over. Go to the next song, it's wrong. And I'm going, like, and the rest of it, and so, like, you know, like, the lights and video were not working. Of course, we never try to put in an, enough on track or, you know, the click tracks or anything that we can't play our show. Right. It's just really supplemental. It's mostly so that we can keep in sync with video and lights, which was definitely not happening. And so I'll tell you what happened at the end of this. So finally, we get to the end of the show. Um, we're playing the last song, and we're about, we just barely got into the intro, and the power for the entire arena goes out and never came back on. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? This was just the night for this to happen Damn. because this night has been just a cluster from the middle of it to the to end the- of it. And what I found out is there was a bank, there was a button next to my bank button that was a take all of the buttons and make them the same button button. I swear to God. Oh. And I hit that button instead, and it made them all the second song on the bank. So when I hit the first one, it didn't work. The second one, it worked. And then it didn't work. And so my technical guy, the next day, very delicately took the entire unit apart, took that button, ripped it off, <laughs> Put the piece back together, and that's what I have. So if you look at my controller now, it's missing a button. That's the button it's missing, and I'll never forget the day that that happened. 
It's been great to have you here. And uh, this is such an honor to be here <coughs> at, at, at Drum Channel. I mean, this is such a great uh, educational and socially, uh, you know, inclusive vehicle. And uh, I'm just so proud to be here. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm even happier that you were here to, oh, to, to do this you. with me, man. Let's thank do you. some playing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that that's great, man. And thanks again. Don't forget, this is the book, and now we get to hear him play. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We'll be right back. So, Johnny, I figure we're, we're at the end of our session here. Will you play a song with me? Oh, sure, man. I got some headphones, and uh, yeah, I, I, I like all of them, but this last track... It's so much fun. Yeah, I'd like to do it. Which it's, one? It's the ska track. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have that on mine. Do you have it? On, yeah, I have it? it sitting over here. Let All me, right. Let me start it. So Johnny's never really played these with me. We don't know what we're doing, but we are going to have fun. Yeah. So enjoy. Yeah, baby, that was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny Vatos. And you can go on to Drum Channel, search Johnny Vatos, and you'll see some great shows that he has all ready for you to check out right now. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Join us on Facebook and Instagram. And when you go to drumchannel.com, you're going to have all the information that you'll ever need to learn how to play the drums if you've never played before, and you can become a pro. I'll see you here next week on Lombardi Live. I look forward to it. Have a great week. <laughs>